in this Billy. Conference will, this with... conference will now be recorded. All right. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I wanted to go through a little bit about sustainability and what we're doing and trying to execute sustainability. And then I wanted to touch a little bit about the World Gold Council and the responsible gold mining principles for those in case you're unaware and what's going on in the trend for that. Um, along with me, I've got my colleague, Natasha Dombrowski, who's the uh, Director of Environment um, for Kirkland Lake Gold. And she's been uh, involved with me on this journey on sustainability and has also been uh, part of the authorship of this presentation. I suspect she's waving and saying hi. I was just scrambling to find the unmute button. So thank you for that, Mom. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I'm going to get started now. My computer does have a little bit of an interesting lag when I'm on this GoTo meeting, so bear with me uh, when I'm moving slides. Um, and <clears throat> it may take a, a minute or so, but um, as you probably all know, you can't start a uh, mining or at least a mining company presentation without this uh, fine print. Uh, it is the contribution that our lawyer provides to these presentations. So basically, inadvertently, if there's any forward-looking statements, et cetera, that they're completely um, inadvertent. And if there are any forward-looking statements, these are some clauses in there that protect, I guess, Kirkland Gold. So for those who do not know Kirkland Gold, I put this up, uh, put this slide up. Kirkland Lake Gold has been a prolific and exponentially growing company. When I joined three years ago and when Natasha joined 10 years ago, the company was very different than what it is today. Um, a lot of it is associated to the people and the leadership and the vision of Kirkland Lake Gold to become uh, the tagline has been going for gold. But the subtlety around that has been trying to be the best at what we do, trying to grow and, you know, from where we were to now we're roughly about you know one point let's say 1.4 million ounces of gold production a year um you know operating costs and aiscs there just to give you context we've got a you know assets in ontario which is in where um it's called Macasa. it's our flagship project or flagship asset in northern ontario and kirkland lake We've got an asset that we recently acquired this year called Detour Lake Mine, which is also uh, north of Cochrane. And then we've got Fosterville out in um, the state of Victoria in Australia. And then we've got some other um, closed sites as well. But overall, in the grand scheme of things, uh, I don't know where the rankings and things go, but as a Canadian gold mining company, we do think uh, we're a good story, particularly with the stories that have happened with consolidations, et cetera. We understand the role of being a proud Canadian gold mining company that's still based and headquartered here. And we are embracing that role and look to try to grow that role. And along with that role comes with comes some responsibility. And the responsibilities generally are around besides just being a good gold miner, et cetera, but people expect and we expect to be a responsible gold mining company. And there's many spectrums of responsible gold mining and there's, it starts from statements, visions, policies, to then eventually executing that and getting into procedures and making sure that you're doing what you say you're gonna do. On this slide here, not planning to read the whole thing, um, as you can all follow along, but in case those who are on the phone, essentially what we're trying to say is that what we believe in and what we would strive towards is obviously ensuring safe working environments, but implementing responsible environmental practices and creating meaningful opportunities. What we don't realize the mining sector out of, I believe the 17 sectors that exist Energy, mining, and agriculture are the ones that actually are the ones that are involved in working in remote communities, working with indigenous communities, providing an economic backbone for uh, some of these remote communities. And that burden is shared by the mining, mining industry. And so 
as much as we've talked about other sectors and creating local opportunities, I didn't realize how important it is until I got to Kirkland Lake Gold, where the local towns are heavily dependent and very much intertwined with our mining operations, which sometimes in Southern Ontario we forget. And then that leads to the remaining two bullets of maintaining and building strong community relationships, as well as trying to make sure that we provide opportunities uh, for the communities where we operate. So sustainability, uh, I mean, looking around, um, I apologize, I haven't been able to look at all the names that on who joined, but I think knowing some of the folks, uh, you know, who've been involved in mining and sustainability, understand the sustainability and in general, the coin term now of ESG, which is environment, social and governance, if you ask three people for the definition of that, you'll get four answers. And it's just because it's hard to quantify. Certain things are qualitative, certain things are quantitative. So what I wanted to share was on this slide, this provides a little bit of a spectrum of the different things that, let's say at least specific to mining, what are the elements of sustainability? Now, I don't think it's new to anybody here, but when you start working in the mining side, and I'm saying that because I used to be in the consulting side, you have to look at all of these things and you have to look at all of them in, with the appropriate lens. Um, you, you know, my background, if I came in specifically environmental and not so much social, um, they're all equally weighted and they all play their own important role. Now, because today I'm trying to maintain within this 30 minute schedule, I've only focused on some of these elements I wanted to talk about today. I don't mean to diminish the other topics, but the idea is I wanted to touch on a little bit of what's going on and what we're doing in these spaces, particularly no, and there's no particular order here, but I've tried to hit these particular topics for today. But I'm happy to take questions or Natasha can take questions on other aspects of ESG. Um, the other thing that's exciting or interesting about this role is a lot more there's more than just mining companies who understand the importance of this but communities have always understood this but the investor community is also getting on board there's a lot more focus from investor communities who are looking to these things and their approach historically has been and you know chris twig mollis who's you know probably godfather of mining if that's the right term can tell you the evolution of this it started from a compliance based and it started from EMS and you know safety and health and safety. Then it really became a risk tool and it became investors were looking at this to say, from an investment point of view, am I investing in something that has a potential risk? And the risk based approach was where investors came. They wanted to ensure that their money is in a mining company that tomorrow is not going to have a strike or has some political immunity if there's a government change. But that trend is moving towards what I'd say no more just risk-based. I think investors are now looking to understand what is your contribution to world goals and contribution to the world's sustainable development goals. And this was probably underscored with the United Nations SDG. A lot more questions come towards Sure, you're a mining company and we understand you have mitigated a lot of risks, but what are you doing towards poverty? And what are you doing towards um, hunger and economic contribution? And it is an exciting change that I'm starting to see that, you know, not one particular company can address all of those goals, but it's becoming a more forward looking uh, statement. And I'm not sure, Chris, if you wanted to comment or if you thought anything around that, the trend from your experiences. I'm assuming silence is consent. He agrees with everything I say. So, um, so starting on the topics that I mentioned, I wanted to start with greenhouse gas. And the reason I chose greenhouse gas first is it is something that has become more than just a technical topic, but also a, it's become a political buzzword as well. People talk about greenhouse gas sometimes a lot of emphasis is put on greenhouse gas more than it should because sometimes people assume greenhouse gas is the be all end all of sustainability. Um, the reason I wanted to start here is Kirkland Gold has an amazing story on greenhouse gas, which I think gets 
very um, doesn't get enough press. These three assets here, Detour being an open pit mine, Macassa being an underground mine, and Fosterville being a hybrid of open pit and underground, our greenhouse gas emissions to date, now this is the 2019 numbers, we're still reconciling 2020, but these numbers, if you ever look at comparing to other major operations, we are significantly lower. And Macassa probably might be the world's most greenhouse gas in, uh, lowest intensive mine in the world. And I'll touch on that. A lot of it is around our battery electric vehicles. But the global, the World Gold Council has put together a global industry average and they've been put out about a 1.02 or one ton of gold per one ounce or one ton of CO2 per ounce of gold. And if you look on the right hand side, all of our operations are well below that one. Uh, Macasa is, you know, at close to about 0 0.02. So we are in even fossil, even detour, which is an open pit operation. We're still hovering more than half or less than half of the industry average. And it is something that we do take seriously. Next slide is. Sorry if it's it's taking a while. There we go. So this is, as you saw on the cover slide, this is our Z40 uh, battery electric truck, low profile. It was designed in conjunction with Kirkland Lake Gold. Um, Kirkland Lake Gold had started our battery electrical move, battery electric vehicle movement in 2012, and this is uh, we were the first to deploy the first 40 ton underground truck as well. Um, as you can imagine, when you're involved in the R&D phase, you take a lot of pain as well. And we've been working and tweaking this particular design, but we do think it'll help the industry. So we've been heavily involved in trying to improve the Z40 truck. But to give you a sense, and if you know, for those who don't know, some of the reasons why we've gone with this is one, there's just you know, no tailpipe emissions, so therefore there's no dust associated to it underground air quality i mean you've you've just improved in, in, in under underground air quality because of the uh, the zero emissions from the tailpipe uh, there's less heat generated as well and so you know when you're looking at a diesel truck versus a battery electric truck you can actually have you know heat generation during mucking cycle temperatures uh, under two degrees celsius versus eight i mean there's just quite a lot of you know benefits there and then there's obviously the ergonomics. Um, I believe, and one of the, you know the drivers for some of these folks have said that you know just less heat, less vibration, less noise. They're they're less tired at the end of the shift, and they're just their their well-being is better. So we see not only from a greenhouse gas point of view, but we see the business case as well. Now it does come with its challenges, and we're still working through them. But we think it's something that we've taken on as part of our uh, responsibility to try to get this technology, um, I'd say almost ready for others. Uh, this is the first truck that was built ground up. A lot of other battery electric trucks are um, internal combustion engines that have been retrofitted with a battery. This one is uh, built as a battery ground up. This video won't work. We did test this out, uh, unfortunately, because of the frame rates with GoToMeeting. So this video was supposed to try to give you an understanding of the mine, Macassan mine, and how far underground we are going. So I'm going to skip over this video unless I give it one last shot. Nope, not going to work. So just to give you a sense, we've got nine trucks and 24 loaders. So 80% of our production underground is done with battery electric. The remaining is done by biodiesel. So right off the bat, you can see why our greenhouse gas footprint is low. And we're blessed in Ontario with a relatively clean grid compared to other regions. So when we're using electricity, it's also clean. One of the things that um, doesn't get enough attention because of what we're doing here, um, Macassa is also an existing mine that we're retrofitting to electric versus other mines that are being built that are new and potentially building new infrastructure for a battery electric fleet. Um, this retrofit was the an example that we thought is much more replicable. So if we can do it, then others can retrofit their minds towards us. 
The second thing I want to talk about was biodiversity and land use. Um, with the evolution of technology, and for those who joined a little bit early in the banter, we were talking about how the pandemic has created all of us to be doing these things virtually, which we would have never really imagined doing. Um, the one thing that we found also that with the drone technology, we have uh, waste rock piles and things that we would like to eventually close, but because of the slope of some of these things, um, it's hard to have safely have someone go out there to have seeding done on these uh, slopes on waste rock piles. So at Detour, we have been uh, this year trialing out this drone that flies and seeds the area. And you can see that the results at the bottom, though it may look like it's not much, but that's grass, which is a generally uh, less aggressive seed mix that we're using, is starting to grow natively on bare rock, which was something that we could never do before, just because we couldn't get people safely on those slopes. What this would do is, if this, would, if this works, we can have a much more aggressive rehabilitation program that has much more... Um, vegetation and trying to bring the land back to its natural state. So this is something that we've been working on and we're um, not saying that we're at the forefront on it, but we're definitely taking an advanced approach now, even though the Detour Lake Mine is not planning to be closing for another 30 years. Along with that, we try to make sure that as we're building, we have a progressive rehab program. So for within Detour, every year we've committed to trying to recover uh, 10 hectares back and return back to its um, natural state. So this year again we've completed our 10 hectares um, to bring back to its natural state. And then what you may or may not know is within Northern Territories we've got an asset that has a legacy of mining for over 100 years and we're now starting a very comprehensive rehabilitation program for the Northern Territories and this one I'm hoping at some point we can talk about as a case study because it was it's taking into account how mining was done 100 years ago, how the understanding of acid rock drainage and metal leaching, there was quite a lot of things done that probably don't uh, well do not meet the standard of today. So cleaning that up is something that uh, we're embarking on. It's definitely a story that we're hoping that we can be proud of. Um, and we've initiated some closure measures for our other two properties here in um, Kirkland Lake North. We call them Taylor, Holton, Holloway. Those are just underway and they're within Northern Ontario. So we'll have more to report on those. But learning from these other sites and what we're doing with drones, what we're learning from Northern Territories, we're pretty confident that we can turn these two properties back to its natural state as well. Continuing on the topic of biodiversity, um, we've got uh, a natural, um, I guess, a natural forest population around our area. And to particular Northern Ontario, you'll have um, two particular items. You'll either be, if you're far north enough, caribou, and you'll have bats. And though we're doing quite a lot on caribou, I didn't present or put any slides on caribou for two reasons. One is we're doing a GPS collaring program to track caribou and there's some confidentiality on caribou because they can be hunted. So trying to track their whereabouts and how their movement is, what's going on, was something that we have to first get clearance from the feds and as well as the province once our work is done. But there's quite a lot of work being done on the caribou and caribou tracking. and. I almost safely want to say that we're probably enhancing the caribou literature for Northern Ontario based on some of the work that we're doing. But on the bat side, um, tree clearing and things can impact um, bat habitats. And one of these projects that we're looking to start, which we're thinking is going to be quite fun, we're building these bat houses. And we're going to try to turn it into a a little bit of a workshop where we have our employees have these kits ready to go and we get the employees to build on it and build these bed houses. And the secondary knock on effect is it gives employees an understanding of one, the environment around them and what's going on in terms of bat and bat habitat. And it's just a more hands on way of educating our employees. And two, I think it also communicates the importance that we're giving to these as well. So we want our folks on the ground to be the champions. 
So if they're saying, hey, no tree clearing between April 1st and August 15th, we've made that a very hard rule now. We do not do any tree clearing between those windows, mainly because it impacts um, migratory birds as well as bats. Water, there's no topic around sustainability that you can't um, not talk about water. Now, the thing, the interesting thing about water for us, um, we've got Northern Ontario has an abundance of water, Australia, now our operation is not in any drought region, but Australia sees more of a drought. So you've got two polar opposites. And so we tried to develop a water management program that focuses on two main things, quality and quantity. And within the quality aspect, we're ensuring that whatever the water bodies around us and whatever water we're releasing is to meet every, not just compliance standards, but trying to meet the standard of making sure that it has zero harm, as well as it doesn't affect biodiversity in the area. Um, we're doing some studies within Macasa to further look at mollusks and clams, et cetera, and the impacts associated from our emissions of water in the area. Now, Macasa, I know you couldn't see the video, but it's located right in town. So that creek is not a remote creek. It's a creek that people are, um, it's, it's a vital part of the creek and part of the town. So we know that when we're discharging to that, we have to keep a very close eye on making sure that that discharge is uh, pristine. Um, other things that we've been doing in water, I'm not going to try to touch on specifics every single one here, but the idea is that, you know, either we're trying to retor return in Northern Territories, for example, return the water back in such a way that it can be used for other people, understanding it's a scarce resource. So where some of our water right now is being used by local mango farming in Northern, in North Northern Territory, and Detour right now and Fosterville are both zero discharge sites. And so we understand that our water, when we use it, we want to use it responsibly and then return it back to the environment in a responsible way. And then quantity, the idea, quantity, as obvious it is, as it is, you know, recycling, trying to minimize the amount of water we use. Uh, we know we're drawing water from the land and we'd like to return it back to the land as, as the way we found it, if not better, but at the same time, trying to find ways to minimize our water consumption. Um, regarding tailings, you can't talk about mining without tailings. And for those who are familiar or aware, there's a new global standard for tailings that's been released with the ICMM and United Nations. And we've been involved in the uh, kind of the background in terms of the formation of those, the principles around it. And because of that, and just because of our focus on tailings, we've been ahead of the curve on tailings. Um, all our facilities and all over the world currently already meet and exceed the global tailing standard. Um, and that's just something that we've been working on before those standards even formed. Um, two things about our Macasa tailing storage facility, which um, if you look at the bottom right picture, that's Natasha there in the middle. And she's standing in front of a deep soil mixing rig. And deep soil mixing is a, a methodology that can enhance the stability of the tailing structures. And we've employed a thickened tails. And I was gonna say, maybe Natasha, if you're still there, um, you know this stuff inside out about deep soil mixing and some of the work we're doing thickened tails, if you wanted to say a few words. Sure. So. The interesting thing about some of the deep soil mixing work, um, you know, at the Macasa site specifically, this is the first instance that this particular technology has been used to improve uh, deep soil conditions in relation to tailing storage facilities. So something fairly new and novel um, being deployed in a different way. So something uh, interesting, we're talking about shear keys in Northern Ontario, we deal with a lot of clay and we deal with water, lots of water, um, and of course, foundation conditions in making sure that they are, as Mohammed said, safe, secure, and if, you know, if things are moving that we can mitigate and correct that. So implementing this technology was a really neat way um, to get the conditions that we wanted for this state-of-the-art facility. So 
when I'm looking at the slide, Mohammed, you said bottom right. I think that I may be seeing it in reverse, but at the bottom, needless to say, you can see our, our new facility state of the art at the bottom there. Um, and in the top, you can see our Macasa facility that we are currently bringing to closure. We actually deployed the same technology there. So not only did we improve foundation conditions of a new facility before we broke any ground, but we also used it to improve foundation conditions of our current facility that we are bringing to closure um, and bringing to current standards. So sort of a, a really neat project. Yeah, the bottom right is just a photo of you. If that's oh, okay. Fine. But the soil mixing, the, what I found interesting, it was used by the um, offshore rig industry and we decided to see if we can find use for it here. And it's basically sending down, I forget how far, but basically a concrete pillars along our tailings dams to increase its strength. Thank you, Natasha. Um, community involvement. This one is something that's near and dear to both Natasha and I. And I'm not going to try to go through the process of the specifics, but as you know, mining companies, we have our direct impact, but there's an indirect and an induced impact. And the part I wanted to share here, and for those just to understand, when you're working in mining companies or when you're working as a consultant for the mining companies, we, as Kirkland Lake Gold, um, currently, you know, roughly about, I believe, 80% of our procurement, if not 86%, I believe, happens locally within 100 uh, kilometer radius and we understand our impact there so we have been besides just wages our goods and services we've been focusing and trying to ensure we procure those goods and services locally um, even that uh, Z40 truck one of the parts of the agreement was it had to be built in Kirkland Lake we wanted to build those industries um, you know Sudbury wasn't built overnight you had to have industries and supporting industries around so we understand that direct impact that we have on wages and goods and services. The indirect impact is from those various uh, suppliers and producers uh, that provide us materials and intermediate products, uh, like for example, Phil Kinsilla, who's on the phone, uh, that you know he's got, you know, with Heath and Sherwood, they're based in Kirkland Lake. They employ people and they do stuff. So we understand the knock on indirect effect that if we can try to keep as many of the local businesses um, involved, um, then they have a knock-on effect that provide benefits locally as well. And then the induced impact is the part that those individuals who have disposable income in the area, then they start work going to restaurants, they start you know, buying gifts and going to barbershops and doing stuff and spending money in the local economy. And that is the induced impact that we understand, that if everybody has healthy, stable jobs, it spins off a whole secondary and tertiary industry. Now, where sponsorships and donations come in, when those tertiary impacts are flourishing, you start having, you know, secondary or sorry, I'd say um, tertiary impacts around mental health institutes, arts and crafts and culture and other things that may not necessarily, that we take in Southern Ontario for granted, aren't always abundant there. And for those to mature, you need to have a stable economy for a while. And so our sponsorship and donations are trying to, that's why the arrow shortcuts there, is trying to provide a feed into those kind of programs, uh, particularly for the not-for-profits, et cetera, that are important for society, but take a while to build. So we're, we understand that we can play a catalyst in that role and to get those programs up and running. And so that the communities that our people live in is a wholesome, complete community. One example was there is a MRI unit that we donated towards. I believe we put five million towards it in Kirkland Lake just because it was a, our employees live there. They'd have to drive all the way to Timmins for any kind of MRI work. So we just decided to sponsor and get one built in Kirkland Lake. And it's because we want the town to have all the amenities and all the other components of what we sometimes can take for granted in Southern Ontario. The other topics I wanted to touch on before I end off uh, on the Macasa, I put them as links here, but I, I was going to going to open them up, open them up, but my with the computer what's gonna happen is it might be a little bit slow and if it doesn't work, then I won't bore you through these because 
What we've also tried to do is improve our disclosure. Uh, this here has been a big focus on trying to improve our disclosure. So on our website, we started putting together standards on how we work with communities and how we plan to engage with them. And though we've been doing this, you know, Natasha has been there for 10 years and I could say that she's probably been involved in this kind of variation and been doing this kind of communities and stakeholder engagement. But the challenge has been people want to know, they want to see it disclosed, they want to see what it's going to look like. So we've been putting some more effort in documenting some of our engagement strategies, grievance standards, human rights as well, as well as our supplier code of conduct. Um, these are some emerging areas that just required a little bit more uh, documentation and those exist now as well. And it's something that we as a company, as we're growing, we're starting to realize that just because we did it and it was part of our DNA, um, external audiences are looking to see it documented. So in summary, um, you know, we've gotten, as we're growing, I think we're growing faster than we can keep up. So we've been developing and working towards a lot of programs. We've been developing policies. We are looking to obviously comply or we are voluntarily signed up with these responsible gold mining principles. Uh, we're also working towards uh, the towards sustainable mining moving forward. So all in all, we're working towards that, that company that can become that beacon of being a Canadian gold mining company that we can all be proud of. So shifting segue into responsible gold mining, and this is where I was trying to, um, at least for the audience, to get them aware of something that they may or may not be aware of. But sustainability has a lot of definitions, as I mentioned, has a lot of principles and has a lot of pillars. And there's been a lot of programs out there from ICMM to GRI to um, towards sustainable mining. But this year was the first year where the World Gold Council made one that's called the Responsible Gold Mining Principles that's focused on gold. And what's exciting about that is as much as mining is mining, but gold mining has its own specific issues, you know, from artisanal mining and from mercury use. So this was the first stab at the Responsible uh, World Gold Council in developing principles that are very specific to the gold mining industry. The icons on the right represent the 10 focus areas. And then the website, if you ever go to the Responsible Gold Mining website, there's the full document um, guideline on how to address these things. What I wanted to share here is for those who are working with gold mining companies or for those who work as service providers, be aware that this is now something that I think, um, I believe majority of the world, world's gold mining companies have signed on and adopted and will be working towards in the next three years. It's relatively new. So anything that you're providing, and if it has any way of helping in these 10 principles, the gold mining companies would be interested to say, well, okay, well, we're, if you're a supplier or if you have some environmental stewardship or biodiversity or mine closure aspects, and if it can address some of these principles, it's something that allows all of the gold mining companies to be one comparable, not that it's a beauty pageant and everyone's trying to score better than the other, but they have some guiding principles now, which as back to my days when I was a consultant, now it helps me understand oh, what are the key focus areas for a gold mining company nowadays and for the next three years. Oh, and I had the, the whole guide, but if it works, I'm We'll show it, otherwise I will have to pass and I can take q and I mean that it's 12.47. Let's see, is this... So for example, you can see here, it's probably still syncing. So governance, it goes through quite a lot of detail to show you how to address these. And then there's a further supporting document that goes into specific action items for these things. I found this to be quite useful, particularly when um, in my previous life and working on projects that are gold related and sometimes we're working on projects that are IFC or World, um, World Bank funded and they have some principles and equator principles. This is something that is top of mind as well for gold mining companies. So ensuring your projects that you're working on, try to address as many of these uh, principles and topics is something that 
I know Kirkland Lake Gold would always be looking for to say, well, how is this particular project? What is it doing on these particular aspects? So with that, I was going to now pause and stop and open it up for questions. Great presentation, Mohammed. Thank you. Um, so we already have two questions in line, and the first one is from Tiago Amaral, and he has asked, um, since KL Gold is a leader on developing all electric mines, how did battery electric vehicles positively affect the ESG factors and scores? Well, <clears throat> so it's hard to determine the direct correlation of the battery electric vehicle and how it did on ESG scores. I do know that when I'm in those meetings, the those scoring indices, scoring rating agencies get interested in and understand the excitement around battery electric vehicle. But I don't think it's moved the needle to just all of a sudden give us a stellar score just because we're battery electric. It just, um, I don't know if it, there's a uh, ripple effect that takes a while for that to eventually resonate, but it has not changed our ESG score in any way. Our ESG score is, um, my opinion is it's a long, it's a long game. It takes a while for those things to resonate. You know, presentations like this to peers and colleagues around the room here, they then start communicating that story and it takes a while uh, for those investor agencies to eventually or rating agencies to pick up on the nuances okay thank you mohammed um the second question is from betty lynn who is also a past chair of cimgta west um, betty says typically mixing tailings destabilizes the soil how does deep soil mixing stabilize your tailings dam are binders or additives used um, Natasha, I'll take the first stab at it and then you can jump in. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and so from what I understand, the way this works, yes, there are some additives and binders that are used. Uh, so when you put that, let me go to that photo, but essentially that drill rig takes an additive and some water and mixes its way down and that additive then forms a concrete pillar. But to the question of if you can repeat that one again of how it affects binding, I mean, or maybe I'll open it up here in the chat window. Mm, typically mixing tailings destabilizes the soil. How does deep soil? So from what I understand, the additive is the part that actually stabilizes and creates the concrete pillar. And Natasha, you've been involved in this longer than I have. Any thoughts? No, you're right. Um, and again, I know that Betty, you're, you're definitely uh, more familiar with the paste side of things and concrete and binders, whatnot. But at a high level, at least from what I understand, the idea behind the, the deep soil mixing is to effectively pump concrete into the foundation. Um, and we go as far as bedrock. So sometimes we're pumping, you know, five to 10 meters, sometimes we're past 30 meters. So the intent is to sort of make that bridge from however deep we need to go, whether that's bedrock or, or something at least stable, and then we pump it all the way up. So we're effectively making this wall or the shear key. Um, and again, I think that the idea is when we're when we're going in and we're making these pillars, you can see the rig sort of behind my head in the picture, it's displacing some of those looser, um, less stable clays and whatnot to make room for the concrete that we're putting in. So at a high level, that's sort of how I understand the, the technology to work. And it's showing pretty promising results as well. Already our factor of safety we've noticed is uh, improved significantly, particularly when we had some of our uh, third party and EORs come by. Yeah, that's right. Great. Um, we have another question from Brian Edwards, uh, who also says great presentation content and direction at KL. Well done. Um, his question is, how do your sustainability efforts differ when you address detour versus Macassa versus Holt, where two are drive-in sites and underground sites, and detour is a remote open pit site? Good question, Brian. Um, and I think that's the part that um, the subtlety of your question, or the the part that I think is profound, is a lot of people take sustainability into that kind of blanket umbrella to assume that you have to address all of these things and 
you know, the materiality aspect of what is important to your site and what is the sustainability metrics that determine the importance to the site, to the performance, as well as the communities has to be taken into account. And I'll give you the example. Macasa right now is a mine site that's in the middle of town. And, you know, it it's hard to tell here because the view isn't there, but we're re literally in the heart of the city. There are there used to be houses even right at the front of the gate. So what we wanted, what is important at Macasa is, for example, specifically very much a noise and dust. It is the most material aspect of a mine site for the town. They would know right away, aside from jobs, et cetera, which I'll get into, but the material aspect of noise, air emissions, and then obviously the economic stability and health of that mine site is important to the town. Versus detour, remote site, open pit, no town, I'd say the closest town is Cochrane, which is still a two and a half hour or three hour drive, depending on the weather. Um, don't have the same concerns around noise and air emissions. Now there are concerns associated to the, um, the biodiversity around the area, such as bats and caribou, but the material aspect of noise and job creation in that area are a little bit different because nobody lives in the town, there's a lot of folks who fly in, fly out. So there's obviously some employment that happens in Cochrane that lives off of the detour success. But the materiality, materiality aspect there is more around water and water resource. Um, there's a lot of water, there's a lot of pristine land. And closure is the other one. They, because of the remote nature of this property and because it's open pit, we have more discussions around how this place is going to look like when it's done. And then to your question, Brian, around Holt and Taylor, those were relatively small footprint assets that had, you know, both being underground, one through a shaft and the other one through a portal. Um, the surface disturbance wasn't very great on either one of those properties. And there was no, there's nobody living around the area. So again, the materiality aspect there were a little bit different, more on jobs and ensuring that we're using our resources properly. Hope that answers that. <laughs> um, okay, so we also have a question from Michelle Cillier. Uh, she says, thanks for a great presentation, Mohammed. You've addressed the big E and S parts of ESG. What would you say are the top of mind aspects from your point of view with regard to governance? So the top aspects for me in terms of governance and, and I say to me versus to a mining company and we as Kirkland Gold are relatively, if not extremely blessed that we only operate in Australia and Canada. So things around uh, taxation, things around ethics, bribery, corruption, you know, corporate governance, there's quite a lot of um, rigor because of the laws and legislations that we operate that the G component gets covered very well. And not saying that some of those other countries may have challenges, but you have much more documentation that you may have to go through, particularly from an outside looking in. But if I were to put the most, uh, effort or the most importance within the G is a lot of the corporate governance because you want to ensure that the proper corporate governances are in place to ensure that the decisions being made at the mining company represent the shareholders and their values and ensuring that the investments that Kirkland Gold is making is addressing the core values of our shareholders and the corporate governance component of it showing that process and transparency is I think probably one of the more areas that I personally think is uh, more important and probably more important to us. When it comes to, um, you know, lobbying related stuff within Canada and Australia, when you're doing lobbying efforts, it is a, it's disclosed. There's certain, I think 40 hours a year, I believe you're allowed towards lobbying and type stuff and anything over that, you have to have some kind of lobbying. Um, I don't know if it's a platform or license. So there is quite a lot of fair um, approach and, 
lastly, it's always deal, dealt with our legal department. So as far as I understand, I don't get too involved either. Okay, Mohammed, uh, we have another question from Phil Cancilla, who says it's great to hear and see you. And also, are sensors on the tailing stem to dedicate ground or seismic signals and ground movements? Ooh, I think I know where to pass this question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Phil. So uh, on both of our facilities, so we have the Macassa TSF, which is going through um, closure right now, as well as the NTSF or the North Tailing Storage Facility, both are littered with instrumentation. So we have piezometers and inclinometers, um, many of which are you know, linked onto our PLC. So we get automatic notifications if there's any sort of movement or pour water changes that are outside of a set threshold or tolerance that we've set, which makes it good uh, because there isn't a person associated with it, right? So alerts go out and we can respond or at least check things accordingly. But you're right, um, lots of instrumentation. I know that the team here at Macasa uh, loathes certain days of the week because there's lots of piezometers and inclinometers that need to be manually checked, but we're working to get all of that sort of set up and, and remove some of the manual component. But it's something that is a huge part of our monitoring and maintenance programs um, and absolutely critical. So lots of good things in place. Great. Uh, just one more question from Benny Lynn. If and when detour goes underground, are there plans of making it a battery electric mine? Um, so in terms of because of the current uh, resource and the grades that we have there, um, we have explored and looked at if there's possibilities to go underground, but it hasn't been something that is anything real yet. Um, but if we Regardless if we went underground, we still think there might be opportunities for battery electric for even a surface fleet type uh, use. So some of those, um, if it's not the giant uh, haul trucks, it could be some of the other surface fleet. So regardless of the underground component, we are looking to see if there's some kinds of battery electric components. If there is uh, trolley assist to go up the ramp, we're looking at a lot of those things, but nothing, it's still early. We acquired the property January 31st. And then, uh, as you know, things went a little bit uh, the way. So we've been focusing on some in initial capital investments to bring that property into a uh, into an operating asset that can return, provides a return on investment. And then future plans, stay tuned. We, we're not against battery electric if it can work. Great, thank you, Mohammed. Um, that looks like uh, all of the questions for today. So really appreciate your coming back to us, Mohammed, and, and giving us this presentation. It was excellent. Um, everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, we will be taking a break for December and look for more notifications from us in January. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for the invite. Uh, and, and thank you, Natasha. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Okay.